first item is public comment. Uh, the, the chair does request that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board of directors. Is there anyone that wishes to address the board at this time? Seeing no one. The summary of the March 4, 2015 meeting minutes. Are there any comments, changes, suggestions on the summary of the March 4th meeting? All right, seeing nobody, we'll move to informational items. Um, it will be the Brad Calvert Show tonight because all three of the informational items are going to be presented by him. So uh, I will turn it over for presentation of MetroVision foundational measures to Brad Calvert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I will be standing here for a very long time. If I start to rest on, might use my elbows to rest on the, the podium, don't tell my mother. She won't be happy about that. Let's see. Thank you very much. Uh, so the first item uh, that the, the group is going to talk about tonight is uh, draft foundational uh, measures and the, the draft MetroVision plan as well as um, other measures. And I'll, I'll walk you through a presentation, but this is attachment B um, in the packet. Uh, and it includes a, a memo as well as an attachment. There's a lot in the memo that really is kind of summarizing the attachment to kind of give you kind of a high level uh, version. But I'm going to walk you through all that to really hopefully get you going uh, for, for, for discussion. Uh, to give you a sense of kind of what we're hoping to accomplish uh, this afternoon, uh, ideally um, I would love for the group to kind of feel like you can find consensus around all, a couple, some uh, of these foundational measures in including targets. Um, and if you are able to do that, obviously help us know which ones um, those may be so that we can kind of put that in the done for now uh, pile. Um, and then the other thing to think about is um, are there other other additional information or uh, data or other alternatives that you would like to see as this conversation continues uh, potentially into the May time frame. Um, the other thing that you have uh, as an option before you, and we've actually done this with our technical committees as well, is you know we have 10 foundational measures that are proposed, but there's a whole host. There's 75 unique measures uh, with the entire plan document that if there's one in there that really resonates with you that says that should be elevated, that that's critically important, that should be something that kind of should be the one of the headlines of how we're doing in terms of performance for a region, we can obviously talk about that as well. If there's just something that you really feel like uh, should be elevated as part of part of that discussion. Um, the last potential discussion item I would kind of call a fallback position. Um, if, if after talking about maybe the first two for a while, it just doesn't seem like this group is going to reach consensus about foundational measures and specifically perhaps uh, targets, then maybe we should have a conversation as to whether the plan should include targets at all. Um, that, that's not something that's required uh, by any stretch. It's just something that, that to, again, to align with really some of our organizational development work we have, have aimed at having targets associated with this plan. But if this group doesn't feel like you have the information in front of you to have an informed uh, conversation about setting a target, we, we can talk about just not doing that um, as well. So a little bit of background about um, today's um, conversation. Last month, uh, we talked about two plan elements, um, the efficient and predictable development pattern, as well as the economic vitality section of uh, the draft plan. But really, this group simply wanted to talk about measures. If you recall the conversation, that, that's where you focused on. So we sort of regrouped and said, well, let's just let's talk about measures now up front and figure out kind of how much progress we can make uh, at today's meeting. And one of the things that the group requested uh, last month was help us understand a little bit the trends that are going on around um, these measures. So that really is a bit of what I'll cover in the presentation, but, but the attachment um, in your packet really does focus on the, those, those trend data where available for each of the foundational measures in particular. Um, just so that everyone does have a copy of, copy of uh, a sort of reformatted uh, draft of the plan, last month we brought you, th and at the board retreat, we brought you sort of three three sections of the plan, sort of the overall plan piece, uh, a piece that was focused on measures, and a piece that was focused on local and regional actions. And this group found it kind of hard to follow and to track with three separate sections. So we've recombined them all so that you have that version, if, if that's your preference. Uh, everyone should have a hard copy, and there are also links. Um, and two of the memos have links to the, uh, to the electronic version as well. 
Uh, I've already mentioned the attachment has even more data and information than I really will cover in my presentation. And I just want to give you a heads up. We are um, putting forward um, for you, you all to talk about a, an alternative uh, foundational measure kind of related to foundational measure nine. Uh, this group talked quite a bit about uh, cost of transportation, delay, and those sorts of things at the last uh, meeting, and so we wanted to put something in front of you to see if maybe that gets to some of the issues that the group uh, talked about. We've talked about this quite a bit, um, both at the board uh, uh, workshop, but as, as well as some other um, orientation sessions that we've had. So I don't think this is really news to anyone, but recognize there are 75 measures that are proposed in this plan. And really, the, the primary difference between a foundational measure and everything else that's, that's uh, proposed as a measure is simply that a foundational measure has a target, and they're sort of the headline measures of the plan. So we put a what we hope is a manageable number um, for you to discuss, 10, but obviously if the group feels like more um, would be appropriate, we can talk about that as well. And I think it's important to understand that these are regional measures and targets. Um, that, that sometimes gets lost on folks. This is, this is how the region is going to evaluate itself as in terms of performance uh, going forward. Okay. So again, I'm going to walk you through each of the 10 foundational measures, mostly covering stuff that was, that's in the, um, uh, the attachment. Um, quickly on urban centers, uh, I don't think we should prob my recommendation is to hold off on this one and let's talk about it in May. We're just short one data point that would really help with this conversation, and, and we could probably talk a little bit about some housing data that we've uncovered that would be helpful, but we don't have the employment yet, and we just it made sense to just, t when we had the full data set to talk about this, um, to do it that way. So uh, I'm going to walk you through a little bit um, in terms of some, some related measures, but, but really I think it would be best to hold off on this. Obviously, the group can, can make that, that determination um, along the way. Um, one of the things that we wanted to make clear in the presentation uh, was that while there are foundational measures, uh, each of those has a, a series or a suite of measures that throughout other places in the plan that really are strongly related to that. So maybe there's something about the foundational measure that doesn't um, resonate with you, but there may be something in a, a series of measures that are, that are related that maybe speaks to you more, um, more easily. Excuse me, Brad. Uh, Mayor Cernanek. Brad, uh, you know, appreciate uh, maybe pushing this one off a little bit, but if you're looking for some additional data points and possibly pushing it to uh, a May discussion, one of, one of the, the questions that I had in looking at the measure um, is you do have the baseline, but you don't have what's already been zoned or accommodated that's somewhere on a, on a drawing board um, across the, the region that already has some elements of housing uh, that's in it. And so, uh, you know, my question came up on this one, not as worried about the stretch that might be in employment, but particularly in the housing and the density that's being looked at there, um, how much is already uh, in, the, in the land use plans that are out there, recognizing they can change, but how much is already out there that, uh, and so how much is a, is a stretch yet? So in May we can come back and we could, we, could, we could add that. And the other thing that we can do, which was actually part of the um, scenario analysis work is, uh, each urban center, when designated, tells us their future uh, projections for population and employment. They're sort of their local aspirations, so we can share with you what that figure uh, looks like as well, and it may align pretty well with that uh, request. Uh, so again, when it comes to urban centers, there are lots of measures in the plan that are really related to this topic beyond that foundational measure. I mean, these places are, are thought to be highly amenitized areas that, that give people around the region access to employment, services, housing, um, and all the things that come with that. And so there are lots of measures related to that, whether it's um, thinking about where healthcare facilities are locating, um, housing and employment, um, not only in urban centers, but also in adjacent um, areas that are well served by transit. There are just lots of related uh, measures um, on the issue of urban centers. So now getting to the, to the stuff that maybe makes more sense to talk about today. So there has been a long-standing measure uh, in MetroVision to increase the region's overall density within the urban growth boundary and area by 10%. Uh, the, over the past eight, nine years, 2006 to 2014, we've actually seen a 7% increase in density within that area just in that, in that time period. Um, so, so given that, and in particular our region's investment um, in transit and in urban centers, uh, the MetroVision Planning Advisory Committee, our technical committee, recommended that we, we get a little bit more ambitious with this measure and go to a 25% increase in overall regional density within that UGB UGA between 2014 um, and 2040. 
again, things that are, there are things related to that measure um, as well. Um, in addition to thinking about what's happening within the urban growth boundary and urban growth area, um, the plan does rec recommend that we actually monitor development that's happening outside the boundary um, as well. Um, and one of the things that if you hear Jennifer talk about UGB, UGA, um, she often describes it as Swiss cheese. People think of it as this sort of contiguous blob, uh, when in reality there, there are lots of holes within the UGB, UGA, and a lot of those holes are really protected open space. And so that's another thing that we're measuring is, is, is open space ar around the region, but also um, within things like the, the buffer between uh, freestanding communities and the remainder of, of the region. Uh, on Foundational Measure 3, um, Combined Cost of um, Housing and Transportation, the, the memo mentions this, but I'll go ahead and say this um, first, because I'm going to walk you through some, some things. Um, staff at this moment is going to recommend actually moving this from a foundational measure to, to a secondary measure. Uh, last month, the group spent some time talking about this, and it was sort of thrown out the idea of maybe looking at a white paper or looking at this more closely, and so we did. We started, we started down that path. We started looking more closely at this, and we just we, we, we grew less and less comfortable with the national data source that we were going to use to, to track this measure over time. We still think it's important to understand how this compares, uh, how, what this figure looks like for the Denver region and maybe how we compare uh, to other places, but there was, and I'll explain to you a little bit more um, as to why there was, we just began to have less and less comfort about understanding how this region can influence the data that comes forward to, to measure this. Um, the housing cost stuff is actually pretty straightforward. It really comes straight from the census. That one's not the issue. It's the, it's the, it's the transportation costs that really rely on national spending averages that make it very difficult to understand how, as this region changes, those costs may change. And I'll, I'll spend a few slides to kind of explain that to you. So this is a simplified version of the model that USDOT and HUD use to, to estimate housing plus transportation costs. <laughs> And this is, well, actually, this is just the transportation cost piece in regions around the country. The thing to focus on is the difference between the, the blue and the red circles. Blue means that they are using the consumer expenditure survey and they're using national averages, right? So for the, all the fixed vehicle costs, the cost of the vehicle, the finance charges, what it costs to own a vehicle, insurance, et cetera, that's all based on national average. That's, that's not based on what's happening in our region. Same thing on the average maintenance and, and repair costs. Uh, they are able to, to get to um, some influence at the regional level when it comes to average fuel, fuel costs. How much as a region are we driving? And then really what's the, what's, the, what's the cost of gas in our region? So they can have some local influence. Um, and that, and that, that piece that ultimately adds up to the total cost. And then they can understand what the, what the average vehicle ownership rates are, in particular census tracts or, or block groups around the region. But you can see a lot of this really comes from, from national uh, data sources that you know, this plan is about measuring how this region is changing and how the, the actions and strategies that, that we are pursuing really are influencing the things that are important to us and, and relying on, on this data source, data source really gave us some pause as to whether we could demonstrate year over year how things are, are changing. So that's... I need to wake up. <laughs> Council Member Stolzman. Yeah, could you just take a minute and explain why you feel the national average is not relevant for us in these blue areas? It seems like the people providing the data feel that those would represent sort of everyone. And can you explain why you think our area is significantly different? Um, well, I, I don't know if I, I, I can't tell you that, I, that, I, that it's my opinion that we're significantly different, but they are going to be averages. And so it, it's difficult for us to have a lot of confidence that these averages really are going to be reflective in, in terms of what's um, happening here. Um, the other piece that, that really was, we were already a little nervous about this because this is a brand new measure that we have no idea how often it's even going to be done. Um, there's the possibility that this could be every two, three, four, five years. We're still suggesting that this is something that we track. We're just simply saying because we can't routinely and regularly um, uh, update how we're performing on this, that maybe it just sort of slides into that secondary measure um, uh, arena. Commissioner Holland. I guess my question is, is when we look at, at the top uh, formula, which is fairly simple, um, with an increasing number of, of car, own, uh, car uh, owners are moving to a lease agreement, how is that going to be calculated into the, into the, uh, into the uh, vehicle cost? 
I think that's a good question that maybe the next slide will be a, a good way to have that conversation, if we can hold that one. Councilmember Kanich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just ask a process question first, which is are we going to discuss each of these as we go through right now, or is he doing an overview of all of them and then we're going to do a slower discussion? What's the intent? I think that's a very good question. I think the intent is to have an overview first and then go through questions um, rather than kind of breaking it up. But All right, so I'll hold my question then. Thank okay. you. So I think, I think this slide helps with Commissioner Holland's uh, question. You know, we, we looked, the previous slide was kind of the overall thinking of transportation uh, cost across a region. And so we put a little thought into, well, how, how does that maybe change when you think about individual or personal-based uh, transportation costs? So we looked at really kind of two uh, scenarios that, that, that take, um, you know, a, a new car and, and how much it costs to, to own and maintain and to use a new car versus a long, you know, the typical fleet uh, for used cars is about is about nine or ten years old um, in our region, and so just for a, for a typical new car, just the, the the actual note on the car is more than fifty percent of of what people are paying for their transportation costs. So this is a fixed cost that you can imagine varies across the type of vehicle that you're in, right? This this was I believe based on a twenty eight thousand dollar new car, and I, I think we all know there are plenty of cars that go well above the twenty eight thousand um, dollar price tag. And you can imagine that variability also kind of comes into play on the sort of long-term uh, used cars. So again, you know, typical fleet of used cars in our region is about nine or ten years ten years old. And I, I can speak to this from personal experience. I have a ten-year-old car that is paid for. So I have, for me, this is zero. But there's there's also someone that has just gone to a used car lot and has bought a ten-year-old car and has a car note, right? So you could go from someone who is paying a quarter of their overall cost. Um, simply to, to make the note um, on that car to someone like me where this is this is ultimately zero. So both of these are kind of a long way of saying this as, 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 a, as a notion of getting to something that really helps us understand overall transportation costs in this region, either from a regional total or how it impacts individual um, households, is a really tricky proposition. Um, particularly, as I mentioned, for the, for the other measure, the combined housing and transportation costs, you know, we heard loud and clear from stakeholders that this is a really critical measure, and, and we agree. It's just a matter of whether, again, can we, can we see that influence and in, in the shaping of that um, year over year. So we're simply, at this time, recommending that maybe we, we measure it, but it sort of falls into the, the second, secondary measure camp. And the other thing that we have noticed is that because it is so difficult and frankly maybe impossible to get to something that is a dollar figure uh, for transportation costs, there are all sorts of other measures that are proposed in the draft plan that really do serve as really good surrogates um, to, the, to the cost of, of transportation. Uh, and many of these can be thought of as overall regional costs um, as well as how they um, impact uh, individual um, persons and households. I mean, the, the amount of gas that you use to travel clearly is going to have an impact on what, what the individual uh, pays for transportation. And then there are other, other correlations to, to cost and some of our other measures that are really about the, the, you know, the travel choices that you are going to make in terms of how you travel. If you are taking transit or using a bicycle or, or, or walking to work, you know, it, it's safe to assume that overall your transportation costs may be lower than someone that is, that is not making uh, those choices. So this is kind of a summary of, of really what, what I just covered. Um, this is not, you know, the suggestion is not removing this and not measuring this over time. It's just simply maybe it falls down a level and it's just something that we measure periodically uh, when the data is, is available. Um, foundational measure four uh, is the share of the region's households that are, that are cost burdened. Uh, when we looked into the baseline right now for 2013 is 36.2% of households in this region are paying more than 30% of their income towards housing. Um, and the proposed target is to drop that uh, to 25%. We were a little surprised given that every other week there's an, an article in the Denver Post about how um, uh, housing prices are escalating in our region to show. We were surprised to see that um, from 2010 to 2013, we actually saw a decrease in, in housing, um, folks that were housing cost burdened um, in our region. And, Really, it's, it's, a, it's a data lag issue. Um, the American Community Survey, that re which is what we rely on to do this, we have to use a five-year rolling average um, to bring our entire region into using the same data, data set. So there's always this lag. So we, we have this 
you know, decreased by 2.2%, include there's still some recession era um, cost in that. So the further you get out from that, I mean, again, based on observational data over the last few years, you will probably see this sort of tick up um, in a different direction. Um, again, uh, things related to, to that measure, I mean, simply, you know, the types of units, housing units that we have available in our region, um, what we were calling a housing affordability gap, uh, the difference between uh, the gap between what um, renters can afford and the units that are actually available um, to them uh, when, when you consider 30% of their income as sort of that, that target that they should be aiming for. Um, we have a, a, this is a new proposed measure related to the um, health facilities in urban centers, rural town centers, and, and near high frequency transit. This is a new data set for us, so unfortunately we don't really have a lot of trend information that we can share. Um, in general, we think there are some anecdotal promising trends that are, that are happening here. Just the expansion of, of our transit network in general means that there are more places that these facilities can be um, located near. Um, we have many urban centers um, around our region that are really focused around, around, around um, the healthcare industry. Um, so it's really not, would not be surprising to see this begin to head in the, in the, in the right direction, though unfortunately we don't necessarily have uh, the, the data to, to back this up. Um, the other thing that, that, that staff has found interesting, that this measure um, was really stakeholder driven, um, and it really has been about making sure people have access to care when they think about the healthcare facilities. But we've, the longer this has sat with us, the more that we've thought about, well, the, there's also people that work in these facilities. And that's, that is a major growth sector. I mean, a third of all jobs in this country that are going to uh, come online in the next 10 years are going to be in the healthcare sector. And they pay a very wide range um, of salaries. So this is not necessarily just about access to care. It's also about access to, to employment and opportunities for folks that are looking to, to enter that, that employment sector. Um, so um, a series of uh, measures that are, again, related to this, not this measure, but, but are related. Um, we do have a measure related to, for instance, seniors living independently. Um, you know, they may not be in a situation where they want to go to a skilled nursing um, situation. Then they need to be in a situation where they can actually access care around the region in some way. So those, those, those measures in many ways are, are related to one another. Getting over to, to some of the uh, transportation measures, many of which were really carried over from, from the previous uh, MetroVision plan. Um, the last time the board had the opportunity to, to adopt a MetroVision, you adopted uh, a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions uh, by 60% uh, per capita uh, by the year, in that case, 2035. Uh, so what we've given you here is kind of an idea of what the projected trend is as of today. As of today, based on current planning assumptions, we were expecting a 42% decrease um, in greenhouse gas emissions per capita between 2010 and 2040. So the proposed goal is a little bit more ambitious than what the current uh, projected trend is. Um, we've shared information with this group previously and, and the board as well about well, it's happened in the last five or, five or so years with greenhouse gas emissions, and we haven't seen a huge reduction. That's largely because most of the, the reductions happen in the out years as we see a lot of fleet turnover and to get to more uh, fuel efficient um, uh, vehicles. So we, again, you can understand that there are very, very direct um, other measures related to this, whether it's the amount of petroleum uh, burned or, or air quality uh, violation days. Again, another, another uh, measure that was really carried over uh, from the uh, MetroVision 2035 plan, which is this idea of um, how people get to and from work. Um, the measure was flipped a little bit. It, the previous way that it was written is to reduce um, the amount of uh, trips to work via a single occupancy vehicle to 65%, and really all we've done is propose is sort of flipping it to kind of the increase to, to 35%, those non-SOV uh, trips. Uh, currently projecting about a three percentage point um, increase um, by 2040 uh, for this measure. So again, um, the overall target is, is, is more ambitious than the current status quo in terms of uh, current planning assumptions. Uh, you can look in your packet and it shows, I don't know, probably 10 years or so of data on this particular point, and really it's kind of inconclusive. We've had years where, that's, where it's gone down, we've had years where it's, where it's come back up. Um, but understand that this goal in particular is very much aligned with a lot of the other goals that, that, are, that are laid out in the plan, whether it's congestion, per capita VMT, or, or uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Lots here, again, related to this, um, many of which are they're kind of two ways to think about this. Some of these are enablers, things that you can do to allow people to take 
um, alternative modes to work. I mean, you have to have facilities in place for that to happen. And then some of them are more like sub-measures. I mean, if you have to add up people taking transit, people biking, people walking to get to that overall number. But we are suggesting in the measures to ultimately measure that, those sort of sub-measures as well. Um, on number eight, um, again, another one that was really carried over straight from uh, the previous plan uh, to reduce per capita VMT in the region by, by 10 percent um, until the, the, the planning horizon year, in this case, uh, 2040. Um, in general, I would say that this is either decreasing slightly or holding steady. It kind of just depends on your perspe perspective, and I think this chart kind of gets to it. If, if, you're, if you're using sort of 2005 as your starting point, I think it's pretty clear to say it's, it's decreasing, right? If you start with 2011, it's a little less clear, right? Um, you know, in general, this is the path you want to be heading, uh, so that's certainly good news. Um, lots, again, related uh, to this measure uh, as well. Um, for instance, one of the things that's been talked about um, quite a bit is sort of person travel versus vehicle travel. Um, and so there is a measure um, proposed in the plan that talks about VMT as a percent of overall person miles uh, traveled. Uh, a couple more, uh, so foundational measure nine, severe, severely congested roadways in the regional roadway system. Adding 1.2 million people and multiple hundreds of thousands of jobs to this region is simply going to result in more congestion. It's, it's, it's a matter of asking ourselves how bad can it get or how bad do we want it to get. Uh, so we go from right now about 1,200 lane miles of congested facilities in our region and again, status quo, current planning assumptions get us to over 3,000 lane miles of congested facilities. So the proposed target is to is just say, let, let's, let's see if we can keep that to more like uh, 2,000 lane miles. Again, several, uh, several items here related uh, to, this, to this measure, and the, the one that's in green is the one that I'm going to sort of talk to you as a potential alternate that really we just kind of thought of mostly based on the conversation that this group had uh, last month. Uh, so this is called average tra travel time variation. I think it's a pretty simple concept. It's the difference between how long it takes you to make a trip in free flow conditions and how, much that, how long that trip takes in, during peak periods. Right? So on a Saturday, you can make a trip in, in 10 minutes. You try to make that same trip Monday at, at 8.30, it's going to take you 12 minutes. You know, you do it. If it's 30 minutes, it takes you 37 minutes, right? Um, so right now, our overall uh, measure for the region is 1.22, so it takes that much more uh, time in those peak conditions. And again, under current planning assumptions, uh, we're estimating that will hit 1.45 um, in in, out in, in 2040. So, this has not been something that we talked about with stakeholders, so we haven't really brought to you a proposed uh, measure, but you know, it's kind of up to this group. Is it, it, first, you should decide, does this feel like something that's important to you? And if so, maybe you have a conversation about what a reasonable target uh, might look like. And then the last of these, um, uh, number of traffic fatalities. Um, obviously, traffic, you know, fatalities and injuries associated with the transportation system, huge quality of life issue. Uh, but it's also a major focus of our federal partners and a major focus of what we do um, here at Dr. Cog. Every couple of years we do a series of, uh, of reports related to traffic fatalities sort of overall, but as well as particularly for um, bicycle and pedestrian trips. So it's, it's already an area of focus, but we didn't necessarily previously have uh, an emphasis in this uh, field in terms of a, an overall um, goal or target. In general, these are trending downwards. These are trending in the, in the right direction. Um, uh, overall, we've had about 66 less fatalities um, in 2013 than we did um, back in 2000. Obviously, it varies year by year, but, but overall, the trend is moving in the right direction. Um, so again, lots, lots related here. If you look at the full 75, you know, there, there are lots here. There are many ways to, to, to measure this. You can measure sort of the number. You can measure it by mode. You can measure it by rate. And so we, we're, you know, the plan, draft plan proposes measuring it in, in many different ways. <coughs> So back to kind of the, the preview of the discussion, I, you know, this is just sort of staff suggestion. You all can take the discussion where you think most appropriate. Are there things here that you, you, you're already ready to, that, to support and that you feel like you can live with? If so, let us know which ones. Um, if, there are, if there are things that you just simply need to know more information, please let us know that so that we can come back uh, with that. Um, in that very long list of secondary measures, 
is there something that in your mind is just, it's important enough that we should elevate it and it should be kind of a headline uh, measure? And again, I, I do think the last question is kind of a fallback position, but if you're really struggling, if just if setting targets based on the information that's in front of you is really difficult, you can make a choice to, to just to not go this route. And we can, over time, measure these things and maybe circle back and ask you later, is this something that you feel like you're now ready to set a target if that's something um, uh, Invic and the board at the time uh, wish to do? And that's it for my presentation. Before we start the overall discussion, I wanted to take a couple of minutes and kind of frame the conversation just a little bit. And uh, Brad's last slide here does part of that for me. But so the first thing I wanted to find out, and in, in these are informational items, so we don't have to have a, a motion and a second and a vote. It's just a, a consensus, a uh, general agreement that, that if I see enough heads nodding, I guess. So the first thing I wanted to ask is on, on foundational measure number three, the suggestion is that although we would continue to measure that, it would no longer be considered a one of the top foundational measures. So can we get consensus on whether or not people are comfortable with that dropping to a lower tier, a second tier, uh, still measurable, but not one of the foundational measures? Commissioner Jones. Um, I think that there is a very important correlation between um, how where you live and how much your transportation costs. And I think if we could measure this, this would be an important thing to measure and have a target around. Um, so I guess I'm reluctant to jettison it yet. Um, and. I guess my preference would be to, to ask staff to do some new, more noodling on whether or not um, there are some local ways we can measure that because I think it's a pretty, pretty important piece of data to get. So I guess that would want be, and I'm curious whether or not TAC weighed in and had any ideas about how we could have a foundational measure around this. If it was this their conclusion, it's just too hard to measure, or because I, I don't know, I'm not ready to jettison it just yet. I don't recall a TAC conversation on this measure specifically, but I don't know if, if you all knew. Um, I know in, in the, the Metro Vision Planning Advisory uh, Committee certainly suggested this, and, that, and that's, that's really kind of where this, where this ended up. Um, and we sort of took it at face value, and, and again, it was the conversation last month that, that forced us to, all right, let's focus on this and really kind of understand how, how it's working. And again, that's where our our confidence got eroded a little bit. I mean, I, I'm, I, I will certainly tell you that group thought it was important, and so I want to I want to carry that message. We just got a little nervous about setting a target about with something that again relies on national data that we aren't quite sure how often we're going to see data points to, to again inform the the board in terms of how we're doing on that. But I'm but I'm happy to sort of take the note about going back and um, your work noodling on this a little bit to see if there's a an alternative way to do this that maybe is a little bit more locally oriented. Well, and I, again, if you think TAC expertise would be helpful to this discussion, I mean, given that there are transportation experts and we're, we're talking about measuring costs, that might be a place that we could go for some ideas about that. Mayor Cernanet. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. A um, couple of questions on, on this is recognizing that uh, Metro Vision is the regional plan um, in the, the I, I get tangled up a little bit in my underwear and thinking about this and saying is this what we're going to be using to allocate transportation dollars or are we looking at this as a measure for the region to say we want to be internationally a desirable place for folks to um, to locate and, and have the, the requisite skill mix and workforce mix that we have and so uh, if, if you're if the leaning is this also ekes into our tip I would say toss it, don't include it. Uh, if it's one of those things for what we want to look at uh, as far as being a, a internationally competitive place to, to locate and have jobs and to have a business, um, then I might say, hey, you know, that'd be okay to stay. Uh, if, it's, if we're taking this uh, and staying, one of the things that <clears throat> uh, I went through uh, and we, we talked about it with Bob Semro of the um, which policy center is he with? Do you remember? Bell. Bell, Bell Policy Center. Yeah. Uh, Colorado has some interesting demographics 
uh, as we go through this. And so national averages would definitely be something that we wouldn't want to be using in this uh, as we're looking to, uh, to change. And so um, understanding how our um, regional demographics are going to be different than the national averages uh, would be something I'd want to be really careful with if we're going to actually put a target on this and look at this as making our progress. So. Council Member Kanich. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, um, I, I agree with the suggestion of looking at whether we could calculate it locally um, and, and, and also um, thinking, it, to me, it's a regional average, so it wouldn't be something that you could calculate for a particular community in a scoring situation. But um, the, other, the other thing that I was thinking about is somewhere in the notes, and I was looking where to find it, you mentioned that other regional plans are using this index, and I think that that to me also opens the door to potentially, and I tried to do this to contact someone I know at HUD to say, if other regions are doing it, then maybe there's a partner there. Apparently there's some grants they've been doing on people doing innovations with the H plus T, so it just seems like we're not the only region that might be grappling with the need for local data, and maybe we can push them a little bit, and I would hate for us to just abandon ship. So, so I very much appreciate the idea of having a look at whether we can do it locally while we simultaneously push with some other regions to get a commitment or a sense of where they're headed and whether they might be a partner, whether we could get a grant fund to help pay for the work, local work, that kind of thing. Um, if, if at any point, you know, we decide to make it a secondary, um, I just wanted to understand what that meant. So I, 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 the terminology is still a little fuzzy for me. So if you can go to the, can you go to the slide where it was up? Um, I meant the the one where it's actually this one, the, oh, number oh, three. Okay, sorry. I'm sorry. Foundational measure number yep. three. So next slide then. Next, 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 next. So you don't have a second. Okay, so this one. So other boxes, you had a slide where it just showed oh. other measures. So is that where this would go? Is that what a quote unquote secondary measure is? And, and it's hard because we don't have your PowerPoint. Yeah. So I can't, there's different stuff here versus what yeah, we're I know. seeing there. I'm, I, I'm trying to look between three things. The, the, the simplest way to understand the difference between a foundational measure and a secondary measure is that a foundational measure has a target. That, that is really the only difference. So we, it's we a are, big difference. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Okay. We, we are proposing that, that when data is available, we will, we will measure and report out on all 75 of these. Okay. But there's only one set that has targets. Okay. So, and I, I don't, I'll preview just a little bit then. Thank you for clarifying that. If, if that's the case and we're thinking about, you know, working, hopefully we can get three there. But if we can't get three there, we're definitely missing something on housing affordability or pricing between measures three and four. And so I would say that I just wanted to lay out that I think we need to look for a metric that gets at that. If this one doesn't work, or and I, you know, we have a, I have a suggestion for massaging number four, but we may be missing something if this gets moved down a level. So just, just I would want to have that conversation as well. Thank you, Mayor Atchison. I really didn't want to talk that much about three as I did nine. So if you want me to wait, I'll do that. Uh, I was hoping that by framing it, there's I've got five different items that I'm going to kind of talk that, that we might be able to. Shorten the list. So far, I'm not being successful. <laughs> well, I'm not going to help you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would. The only thing I had, I was really interested in, in part of the presentation. That part of it came because we just had a presentation by CDOT this morning uh, at the Metro Mayor's Caucus. But that right now, Colorado in the Denver Metro area is sitting at number 41 of 47 for congestion. That's how bad we are. And if we look at what CDOT is talking about, their capabilities over the next few years, because they aren't getting additional funds, I don't see that our vehicle miles traveled or our capacity is in any way is, is going to get increased. So we're looking at trying to think about measurements that we don't have any control over, for one, CDOT didn't have any budget to fix it, and two, unless we find a way to finance this other than through CDOT, the metro area regardless of what park you're in, is not going to see any relief on congestion. 
and that's just not something we're going to be able to, to see a big tick in over the next few years. So whether it stays as a, a piece we continue to measure, knowing that we are hamstrung and can't do much about it for the next few years, unless somebody at the legislature decides to bite off a gas tax and not get reelected, you know, <laughs> you never know what they're going to do. But it's those kind of things. I think they're great for us to know about. But we really aren't going to make any movement in those areas, I'd say, at least five years or more. And that's purely conjecture on my part because I don't see we're going to get any money from anywhere to do it. To the kind of the point that we've been talking about, if you look at what we're trying to determine is what's people's affordability on housing and transportation. I think some of the things we've seen as late as uh, this past weekend in the Denver Post and the perspective section is the cost of housing is going up so much more. $1,500 for a one bedroom, one bath apartment? Uh, there aren't many people that can afford that on, the, on most of the lower end incomes, and even some on the median income because they can't live in a one bedroom at $1,500 a month. And the availability in the metro area is less than 4% vacancy on rentals. What we're seeing is, is a continued burden on people's income just to pay for housing that doesn't leave them much left for anything else. Food and clothing is pretty important to them, but they're getting outpriced by just the cost of housing and what our economy and availability of that housing is today. It's great that we're going to know this stuff, but I'm, I'm concerned that we're going to put expectations on something happening that we can't really control. Council Member Teal. Well, reining it back in. So when it comes to number three, actually, guys, I, I think it, I, I would speak in favor of uh, taking the staff recommendation, knocking it down to the secondary, because I, mean, I thought Robin, I thought uh, Elise had great comments. The only problem is the idea that we should study it more, doesn't that mean we don't have the data to make it a measure? And we heard Brad say just a moment ago that the only difference between a secondary measure versus a foundational measure is that foundational measure has the means to measure it. So if we are saying we don't want to see it fall off the list, we don't want to see it fall to a secondary, but at the same token we're saying we need to study it more, aren't we really saying it really should, as staff has recommended, slip to a secondary measure? Commissioner Henry. I just kind of wanted to add a little bit um, to Mayor Atchison's comment in regards to affordable housing is CSU just recently did a study in Adams County and Adams County is losing out on six million dollars a year in their economy because people are burdened by the cost of their housing. That means that they're spending more money on their housing than they would out in the economy. And so I really think as a region we should be taking a look at it because it's not just hurting, you know, those who are burdened by by their rent or by their mortgage, but th it's it's hurting our businesses and our economy in general. And so I think we really need to to take a serious look at this as a region. Councilmember Plus. All right, you said enough. Thank so. you. Well, I'd like to speak in, in favor of noodling a little bit more also. Um, I actually, this is, I think this is a very important foundational measure and would really like to see if we could make it work still. Um, I, I noticed that uh, in the memo it said similar metrics can be found in peer regions plans. And I'd like to understand that a little bit more and how they make it work. And uh, I think that uh, uh, Councilwoman Stolzman also brought up the fact why why aren't national averages here relevant? And I'd like to know a little bit more about that too. So it, I mean I think it's just such a a key piece of understanding kind of the burden on families with regard to housing and transportation that I would like to see it stay at this level. If we can support that, I understand that there are some challenges, but I think having a target is actually really important. So what what uh, Councilmember Teal brought up. Um, the, the difference between um, being at this level and being a secondary um, measure I think really is a very significant one. So I'd really like to see us try to make this work if we can. I've heard you and had you know, some of the concerns with, with regard to the data and all that, but I'm, I'm not willing to give up on it yet. 
Mayor Pro Tem Malay. Um, and I, I think it makes sense to think about it a little more. And in the context of that, I think um, what we measure, we should have an ability to move the needle on. And so I guess what I'd also like to have an understand, I mean, if we're going to measure something, we can't just keep measuring it if we can't do something about it. And I guess what I need to have a better understanding of what Dr. Cog as an organization can do about it. So as you're talking to TAC and thinking through um, how to measure this, how we can collect the data to measure it, I would also like you to think through some suggestions of how we could actually, how Dr. Cog as an organization could have an impact on this. And maybe the peers, uh, the, um, you said in the background that similar, to met similar metrics can be found in the peer regions plans, and I guess I'm curious what they're doing in those peer regions to have an impact on this, because um, I, are they, do, are, do they also have that federal designation as an as a ED? Or do those peer regions have those designations? Is, or do they have a more uh, broader scope as an organization? Because um, short of supporting legislation for the owner-occupied housing, I, I struggle with what I can do as a council member uh, in my community and as a, a board member here to move this needle. And I think if we list it and we measure it, there is an expectation by the public that we're going to do something. And I need to understand what it is that we are going to do. Um, so if staff could come back with that information, I think that would be really helpful. Commissioner Rosier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, Mayor Cernanek's uh, initial question was, uh, are these metrics, measurables, um, being considered for uh, scoring for the TIP. I don't, I didn't hear an answer to that. Did you, Mayor Cernanek? Jennifer. That's your decision. <laughs> Staff is not making that kind of recommendation on this. That will be something that you will decide um, uh, the next time you decide TIP criteria. It could be it could be, it might not be. I, I wouldn't assume anything. Historically, though, things that have been in MetroVision uh, are used um, uh, in TIP criteria. In fact, I think it's 23 points that are MetroVision related at this point. So okay. it's possible. All right. But staff isn't recommending that. Okay. Um, then based upon that, looking at, at MetroVision's, looking at, you know, if it's TIP criteria, uh, to, to be used, you know, I, I, I don't see, there are too many variables here, and I don't see us going forward with this. If we look at the price of housing, the price of transportation, so many decisions that are made on all of our parts fix the price of housing. When you put a 1% growth limit in your community, guess what? The price of your homes are going to go up. When you say you can only build certain products and they have to be a certain all brick, all this, all that, guess what? The price of your homes are going to go up. And thus, those communities where, who have put those restrictions are, are going to have high, higher costs and higher pricing, but it's self-imposed. And in, in what we're looking here is that they get incentivized for being very, um, uh, bet, lack of a better word, elitist on saying that we're going to only build a certain way and thus price out of the market but look for additional dollars. And if they're going to get tip dollars for that or they're going to get a higher score based upon MetroVisions, I would strongly oppose putting any of this language in there. Councilmember Stolzman. Thank you, Chairman. So I agree with everything that Mayor Pro Tem Malay was saying, um, but I would just want to add, in general, when I think about um, property values going up, people like that. I mean, if you own property, you're happy. It means things are good. Your investment is gaining momentum. And then I agree that the problem with that is that we're pricing people out, you know, young people, people who have uh, less high-paying jobs. So the way the, that's part of the reason why I see this as such an important measure and why I think it's important to try to get a more specific relevant to our area measure I agree the 
what was presented is probably not the best thing to use. <coughs> um, but if we look at housing plus transportation together, we can try to address some of the inequity for the lower earners and people just coming into the market and make Denver a, a place where, yeah, that the property values are great because it's a great place to live and we have great amenities. Um, we do things in our communities that make them better for people's quality of life. So yes, it costs more. I completely agree with that. But then how can we address that through transportation and try to relieve some of people's overall burden so that housing plus transportation cost is overall lower? And to me, that's it's critical to look at it that way. Um, so I also am going to go way out on a limb and say I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with giving tip points for that. So if you're doing something that can lower people's transportation costs, that seems good. So I, I don't see anything wrong with that either. Commissioner Partridge. Careful, Douglas County is about ready to say something. <laughs> I said, you know, when there's, a, when there's a target on you in a room, what do you do? You move. So I, I am not making a motion, Mr. Chair, though. Uh, I want to echo what Phil said and what Don said. I think it's right on target for me because when you're just looking at one measure or any measure, uh, be careful what you vote for. So I, I appreciate staff not recommending that, that it goes to our tip, but I think historically that's what's been done. So i got to say, I have a mistrust with it. I mean, you've got to be careful what you're voting for because if you historically say that's what's been done, I'm just going to assume that's going to be what would be voted on. And then I also want to go to the point of if it's uh, recommended to not be part of TIP, why do we have to have a target? How about we just say that is our goal to decrease it, not really say it's a measure, not it's a target. Just say, hey, it's a guiding principle. Uh, next, I've got Council Member Kanich. I think you had your hand up. Yeah. Um I, I'm not really, again, going to weigh in. I, I think what folks are debating in the TIP criteria question is not so much would H plus T be a criteria for TIP. That just doesn't make any sense. But you're concerned about the underlying value of lowering transportation or lowering housing costs being a TIP criteria. So I just want to <coughs> clarify, they're kind of different conversations. I, I just don't think H plus T would ever be something you would get scored on. But um, but I, I think that I want to just, it was so long ago that we did the scenario planning, but I bring it up because as we, you know, you, you brought a little bit up, uh, Mayor Atchison did about, you know, we can't control these things. I think what we learned from the scenario planning is that in fact we can. It's so hard to kind of get our heads around at this table because, you know, we're working with pieces of paper and out there projects are getting built and there's, the distance between the two is so big. But, you know, when we ran the scenario plans, there was different levels of congestion based on how much went into urban centers and how much didn't. There was different levels of VMT based on how much transit was available or wasn't. Like Things that we make decisions on that were put into that scenario planning actually did change these numbers. So, so I just think like, I just want to share that as we talk through all the rest of these that I do think that we have an influence and my evidence of that is the scenario planning that kind of shows that you can change the needle. And so for this one, for example, I don't think it's that Dr. Cog takes a concrete, you know, I mean, some of the regions, they have things like trying to, you know, we teach folks how to do more affordable housing in urban centers or we locate, if you're gonna, if you're gonna fund housing authority, if you're gonna fund 10 projects, fund seven of them near transit because that'll lower H plus T or whatever it is. So. So I think there's those global ways that all these things get impacted, but it's, it's really difficult to get to the one vote on Dr. Cog that changed that. The scenario planning takes into account everything collectively. So I just think we're, gonna, we're never going to find the one vote at Dr. Cog that lowered this number, just like we're never going to find the one vote that lowered VMT or the one vote that lowered congestion. It's going to be the collective. And, and I believe in that. I mean, I, I think that that's, those models were really helpful in showing me that there are different futures for the region, you know. So I, I hope we'll keep that in mind as we keep debating. But I, I hope we just, we'll have to re-debate this one perhaps. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, I've got, uh, I've got th three on my list right now. Council Member Dyack, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Malay, and Council Member Pfeiffer, and then I'm gonna take a pause. So, mm -hmm. Council Member Dyack. Um, you know, it's it's good discussion, but I mean, to me, uh, in Parker, I'm I'm challenged by a, a lot of these um, RTD. Um, for us, uh, is a challenge to get to get ridership. I mean, in in Parker and Douglas County, we're a donor county. We we more than happily pay for the service, 
but yet we don't get it. Uh, but some of these foundational measures uh, could be beneficial if, if we have something that we're paying for but we're not getting. Um, you know, I mean, to me, data is good data, but uh, you know, to me, I'm I'm challenged as to how we, uh, as Mayor Pro Tem says, can move the needle on some of these things. So uh, data is good, but uh, to create a foundational measure and then to tie it back to to tip seems to be just challenging for me to to accept. I'm I'm kind of taken aback by 23 points within the tip is Metro Vision. Um, I'd like to get more information on which, um, which measures tie to that because if you tie points to a foundational measure or to something, um, you are by definition emphasizing that measure and de-emphasizing the rest. And to me, I think these, these foundational measures are a, co a collective and should be uh, aspired to, to get to to move the needle. Uh, and if we are emphasizing some, and de-emphasizing other, it seems like we're picking winners and losers. Mayor Pro Tem Malay. And I guess I'm going to go back to just asking staff. Um, again, I'm not sure how we reduce transportation costs through tip allocation. I see how we improve VMTs. I see how we improve congestion through our tip and through um, projects in our communities. I don't see how that reduces the transportation costs. So I guess I'm going to look to staff to educate me on that. And then also, I mean, it sounds like what we're talking about are kind of BMPs. Like it, it is a best management practice to locate affordable housing or workforce housing near transit stops. And to me, um, that, that uh, in, and I think it's being done without, I mean, Douglas County just funded a, a, a 60 AMI project that's within a mile of the Lone Tree light rail station. I mean, I feel like we are doing this in our communities and I think we all could be better educated about um, best management practices along those lines. Um, and I think encouraging people to do that is, is one thing, uh, but reducing our transportation costs, I'm just struggling with it. I'm just really struggling with the, our ability to do that as an organization and even my ability, I mean, short of deed restrictions, which I know was you know, suggested as an op option. Um, I need to better understand that before I can accept this as a foundational measure for this organization, I guess. But I do think it's something I have no problem, and I think it's a crucial issue for a region, not suggesting that, that it isn't, so. Councilmember Pfeiffer. Uh, you know, I, uh, I agree that with everybody's statement, and I don't want to beat the horse down, but the it is an issue. We all deal with it in our own communities. And I think we're a good example in Arvada where we, we have a TOD going on. We have a lot of movement in our old town. We have high rise, our t technically our first five story building. We're getting density. And the whole time we use a different word, not affordable. We use attainable. I think Brad heard that from our mayor, crystal clear, that we call it attainable housing is what we're trying to do in Arvada. And, um, when we went to our park place, which is our five-story building by our TOD, we wanted attainable housing. Uh, the, the house is not, or the facility is not even built yet, and I think it's going to be high in the market. And the reason why it's high in the market is because transportation's there. So when you look at this formula, I think it's set up for failure because once you have access to mass transit, your housing goes up. And your housing goes down when you don't have access to necessarily good transit. So I, I, I have a feeling that this is just setting up for failure. And, and because of that, I, I struggle with supporting any type of measurement that needs to be applied on it and should be just something we watch, uh, like Brad was explaining. So I'm leaning that it uh, taking staff's recommendation. Okay. I wanted to take a pause because we are one hour into a two-hour meeting. And we do have a hard stop at 6 o'clock. So um, I thought that I was going to pick, pick and choose a couple of items that we could talk about first that might not take a lot of time. We're on item 1 of 10, and we're halfway through our meeting. So my attempt was unsuccessful. I admit defeat on that part. But what I'd like to do, we've heard a lot of, uh, a lot of testimony on both sides of this, I think. And um, I don't know that we're going to get consensus. So my feeling is that um, 
even though it's an informational item, the staff recommendation is that this drop to a second tier item, and I want to emphasize again, that does not mean that it's not watched and measured. It just means that there's not a target. Yeah. So I would like to see, go ahead, Commissioner Jones. I'm completely interrupting you, but I think what we're trying to do is give staff direction, and I think the direction that we have from staff is we're pretty split on this, and so I, I don't think we're in a position to make a decision on this, so I think maybe, I mean, my suggestion was noodle on it some more, see if the experts that we have on TAC can help us. We, you've noted that other regions are. See if you can bring back more information. Let's not try to decide tonight. Let's just see if we can add a little more information to inform the debate. I don't think we're going to reach consensus, and you're right. I think we should probably just move on, given that we've given staff a lot of direction on this now already. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so we are going to move on from three. Um, let, let me uh, let me ask one, uh, actually two things. Then these probably should have been one and two, not two and three. But the first item is, uh, and gosh, I hope this goes quicker. Uh, the first item is of the other items that are not considered foundational measures. Uh, Brad mentioned that there are approximately 75 other items. Is there anything that people feel that that ind individual feels should be elevated? from that list to be a foundational measure. Mayor Pro Tem Malay. I would be very interested in the one that I think staff is also suggesting uh, about the travel time. I mean, how long it takes people to commute in the region. I think that is something we could move the needle on, and I think it's something we can measure, and I think it's something we should work to reduce. Well, and I think you're, oh. you're referring to the travel time variance, mm -hmm. and what the suggestion is, is that actually take the place of number nine. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, as opposed to? Correct. Uh, okay. Correct. Okay, that was the one. Okay, I, okay. I apologize, but that was to me is very important. Okay. Uh, other comments on Mr. Graves? Oh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Actually, a different foundational measure, foundational measure six. Would you like me to hold my comments? If you would, please. Okay, seeing nobody raising their hand on other things that they would like to elevate as a foundational measure, uh, Council Member Kanich. I don't have one now, but I'm not sure I was clear from reading the packet that this was my chance and my only chance to do that. So I think I, and, I and now, now that I know better, feel like I want to go back and read the secondary measures more carefully, and maybe we have a deadline of alerting staff, and then they can say, okay, we had four proposals that came to us before the next MVIC meeting I, or something I think like that's that. an excellent idea. Thank you. I mm -hmm. appreciate the extra time. All right. Um, The, the, this is probably the one that should have been number one on my list, and that is, can, can we get consensus on any of these items that we think that we can move forward without discussion? And I see head shaking, no. All right. Um, so go ahead, Commissioner. Commissioner Jones. Um, I, we were just talking amongst ourselves. I think that there's probably some that we could easily Six. keep on, but um, Jackie was noting that she still wanted to talk through some of these, and okay. so um, it doesn't necessarily mean opposition. Right. If there's some additional information or questions, I think right. some of them are going to go quickly, though. Yeah. Let's 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 go ahead and and start at the beginning. So um, item number one, actually the, the staff recommendation, as you heard, is that that kind of be put on the back burner. So I'm hoping that everybody is good with that being on the back burner for the moment for the reasons that were given by Mr. Calvert. Yes. Okay. Item number two, house density within an urban growth boundary area. Open it for discussion. Uh, I start to say commissioner. I started to give you a demotion. Council Member Teal. <laughs> yeah, Ro Roger hasn't uh, conceded to that uh, demotion yet, so. 
My only issue with uh, number ten, with number two, and maybe I just don't understand the data correctly, but um, so we're we're targeting a 25 percent increase between 2014 and 2040, but aren't the trend lines pointing to a 10 percent? I guess my concern is we set our measure at the 25 percent, but our data being shown is out of variance by that by 15 points. The 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 seven percent decrease that we're suggesting is really over over a very short time period from 2006 to 2014 I think is what it was and so really what, what it's suggesting is actually the the steepness of that is suggesting that 25 percent is actually may be reasonable that 10 percent may be something we passed in a couple of years so so that's really where this sort of more ambitious target that's, ref, that's reflective of current trend um, came from okay thanks Brad appreciate yep. it other comments, questions? I was just going to speak in goals. support of keeping this. I mean, it feels like we're on the trend line. We're headed in the right direction. And this it makes sense to adjust based on the reality that we're seeing. So I think staff did a good job on this. Commissioner Partridge. You know, wondering if uh, his staff has looked at if we w do talk about average time traveled, if we look at this measure if we increase density, would that also increase uh, congestion or vehicle time traveled? So I'm wondering if we look at reaching one goal, does that negative, have you looked at that, how it, I know that gets complicated, but I think it's something for us to discuss is to say when you. Uh, th this reflects on what Councilwoman Kanich brought up related to the scenario analysis. When we've, when we've looked at this before, when you actually intensify development in the right places, urban centers, places served by transit, you actually see decreases in VMT and congestion and the, uh, the other measures that, that frankly in all other scenarios show no variation or actually maybe even get worse. So can, can you tell me if we actually in increased the density that we will decrease vehicle time traveled? Yes, based on the scenario analysis that was done, I don't know, was that 2013, that, that's what the scenario suggested. Yeah. Thank Mayor you. Pro, Mayor Pro And I guess back to that scenario analysis, when you, when you run the scenario analysis with this 25% uh, increase in density, what does it do to the, have you, I mean, I guess my question is, have we seen what that does to the VMTs um, and to the congestion and then have we put those other foundational measures targets in line with that I mean we, we recognize I think um, Robin's points about these all interplay with each other so I would hope our foundational measures are impacting each other as well so if with this 25 percent target what does that do to our VMTs and what does that do to our congestion times and we we have all these cool tools that we learned about at our workshop, and I want to see what our world looks like when we achieve these goals. So I, I guess that's a, the question I have. And the other question I have, and, and just, just to confirm, um, you know, the old measure was the 2000 to 2035, and now we've, we've shortened the time frame. It's 2014 to 2040 and we've increased the goal. So I, I just want to make sure that, that that there is a confidence level that um, we can still achieve that because if we if we already got that seven percent right away I mean do we have enough uh, redevelopment of some of our um, older areas that aren't quite as dense and do we have enough opportunity in our some of our newer urban centers that are still growing to really achieve that full 25 or do we do we take a lot of that low-hanging fruit already in the 20 uh, 2006 to 2014 period. I guess those are just some questions I'd like to have an understanding of before I agree this is the right number. But the one I really care about is how they all play, interact with each other, the scenarios. Not seeing dissension, I'm assuming that by consensus we'll move that one forward. Item number four. Questions or comments? Councilmember Kanich. Thank you. This, this might seem kind of minor, but um, I think I raised this at the last meeting. So share of the region's households that are cost burdened, spending more than 30% of their income on housing. So I care 
a lot less about a household earning $200,000 a year that spends 35% of its income on housing than I do if a household's earning $30,000 and they're spending 35% of their income on housing. And so I do continue to think that this measure needs to somehow look at those in the at-risk income bands. And so I, I, I feel like this one might you know, benefit from a little looking at, I, I don't know that you change the target, although you may, but you certainly at least look at who are those folks. If you're high income folks spending more than 30% of your income, you're probably doing it by choice because you still have $170,000 left to spend on medicine and clothes. But if you're low income, that percentage means a lot more. And so I just, I, I would like us to look at that. I think the census reports it that way and then maybe have you all think about, and again, if you're taking some of this to TAC, maybe have them think about, do we keep the same metric and just break out the reporting, or does it mean, or the same target, or do we need to refine the target too? But I think it's, it's pretty easy data to look at. Yeah, and I was add that you can slice this any number of ways. So for instance, this, the current baseline is, is a regional average, right? Um, but, if you, but if you look at renters, you know, 54% of renters in the region are cost burdened. If you look at renters over the age of 65, it's something like two-thirds of that population are, are cost burdened. There's, there's a lot of flexibility in the data associated with to give you some, some, some things to choose from. And the executive director has a comment. Yeah, I, I would think, too, because um, looking back at the, your, your mission and vision statement, one of the things that's important is to have um, – a variety of, of housing options and prices and I think maybe we should take a page out of Douglas County's comp plan and maybe break this out into like low, medium, high income so that we know are we hitting in, in all those all those areas. And, and we, may not as a region, we may as a region not worry about some of them so why, why count it against us if we're not worried about it, you know, if we're keeping track. Councilmember Teal. Um, I actually really agree with Robert on this one. Whoa. <laughs> Meeting adjourned. <laughs> Even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs> oh, good to know you have your two times a day. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I agree, I think, and, and like Jennifer, you just affirmed, I do think there would be um, I, I just felt like there's too wide of a hammer to throw here. We need to sharpen that up. And then, guys, I was just disturbed by the uh, by Brad's, you know, uh, input during the briefing on how we're actually kind of dealing with lagging data here. So yeah, if we could sharpen this up before we actually assign that uh, that target right there, uh, I would certainly feel more comfortable. And I, I would just add, the lagging data is something that we will always deal with because. With the American Community Survey, you, depending on the sort of size of your county, you can get one-year, three-year, or five-year averages. And because our region is so diverse, we have some smaller communities where we have to rely on that five-year uh, rolling average. And the census sort of recommends don't don't mix and match, don't report one year for a little bit, and then three years, then five years. Stick stick with one. And so that's where the, the lag really is problematic for us. So with the recommendation of the, the executive director of having basically three tiers in this we can move item four forward? I, I, Mayor Pro I'm not saying we, we, I would like more information. I don't understand what you mean by moving it forward. Moving it forward to continue to have discussion on it? Or yes. I'd like, okay. Yes. Because we'll this see the data and then we'll make a decision. Uh, again, and, I want and, to and again, in the scenario analysis that we, that, and I don't know if the model can do this, but what does our world look like when it's 25%? What, whatever our future target is, what does our world look like? What percentage? What, what are housing costs then? What, what are rental costs then? Um, how, how do we decide that? I guess is what I, I just need to understand or would like to understand. Yeah, I want to remind everybody that this is an informational item and it will continue to morph until uh, this body tells staff to stop making it morph. So yes, we will see it again. So consensus on moving item four forward. Thank you. Item five, questions or comments? Mayor Atchison. The only concern I have with, with these and with five in looking at rural communities, John's got the same problem, 
Dick McLean, some of the others, that don't have mass transit and aren't projected to get any anytime soon. So how do we correlate the fact that that, that this share of health services in these areas, when they don't even have the transportation to be there, is going to be, be measurable? So I guess I'm, I'm trying to run down this. If you don't have this in a town center, if you don't have transportation of any kind for mass transit, how are you going to how are you going to compile this data when you're not measuring anything? Uh, I don't know. John's going to create a new rail line down there all by himself, but right? Okay, and George is going to help you. Yeah, uh, George, I, I, I hope this helps. I mean. This, there's sort of a list of things here, right? And th those are all or statements, not and statements, right? So the idea is that rural communities could have um, health care facilities, but the idea is maybe, they, maybe they're um, uh, in the rural town center where there is this sort of uh, agglomeration of services that, that allow, that, allow that to happen so that the, the broadest set of community members can access um, that uh, health service facility. So it's not it's not about whether they're served by transit or not. No, I'm just I'm just trying to correlate the two is to getting them together is, is how am I going to measure this when I don't have this kind of a facility there to measure it with. Even if I had a health care facility there, I don't have I don't have the town center and I don't have the other aspects of what I need to measure that. And I understand the or statement, but it's just I'm still having trouble bringing that into my mind that I can really measure this. Commissioner Jones, did that work to answer your question? We just wanted to clarify that it was an or statement, that you're near transit, you're in a rural town center, or you're in an urban center, and okay. you clarified. Mayor Pro de Malay. And this one, I could care less if we keep it or we don't keep it, because it's going to happen anyway. I mean, the facilities that are being cited in communities these days are being cited along these near near the high transit lines. They just are. I mean, there was a the new Kaiser facility in Lone Tree, the land wasn't even for sale. But it was across the street from the light rail station and the Kaiser folks went out and found out who owned it and pursued it. So I guess part of me is like, what is the point of us putting it in there to make ourselves feel good? Um, I, I, you know, I, I know, I mean, do we... any goals we can actually attain? Well, no, but, I, but again, at least my point is we're not driving this and we're not moving this needle and it's going to happen anyway. So if we want to feel good about, I mean, hey, I want to maintain the same weight I've maintained since college. Hey, gee, I'm doing that. Good for me. I mean, what's the point? I, I guess, you know, if, if it's, a, it, I guess, you know, if we want to just pat ourselves on the back, I, I just question the value of, it, of this. It's going to happen regardless of what we do. So, uh, Council Member Plas. Well, I'm not opposed to, to goals that we can actually meet, uh, you know, so. Oh, wow. We'll talk afterward. Okay. But I actually. <laughs> I actually think this is important in the sense that it, it reaffirms our, our commitment to, to health and, and the kind of the, the basis health plays in, in terms of economic vitality and you know what we talked a little bit earlier about it's not just for people who are going there as patients but it's, it's also for people who work there and there's an increasing number of these folks. So I'm not opposed to actually being able to reach some of our goals, Jackie. I think you should feel good about that every once in a while. I and just thought you were aspirational. Well, uh, I am aspirational, but I like metrics, too. Um, so I, I definitely think it should stay in there. And I, and I think as we consider the new Metro Vision and the health and wellness piece of that that we have, that makes a lot of sense to have this piece in there as well. All right. Commissioner Partridge, before you do, real quick, though, I do want to point out, again, we have a hard stop at 6, and we have two more items. So, Commissioner Partridge. Very good. Uh, certainly this touches on my past field. So. Does this take into consideration technology? Because certainly a lot of health care is, uh, with the upgrades with technology, a lot of health care is, done being, done being, uh, is being done through internet, telemedicine. So does this take that into consideration, or are these actually hard physical sites? You're talking about health services. These are hard physical sites. Okay. So I, I beg that, that I think we're, we're missing a whole other part of, uh, of the future and the present. Yeah. Consensus on number five. Item six. Comments or questions on item six? Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I have a quick question uh, for staff really around this per capita goal for reduction of greenhouse gases by 60% between 2010 and, and 2040. 
One of the things that we're a bit concerned about, given the rate of growth in the region, we wonder whether or not this is sort of a diluted goal, right? Denver alone is growing by about 10,000 residents per year. And so we're wondering whether or not an absolute goal versus per capita might be in a more a more appropriate measure. So I'd love to hear from staff about how we selected per capita as the measure for greenhouse gas emissions for mm -hmm. for this measure. Yeah, I'll Steve Cook here, transportation staff. Well, this original measure was adopted by the board uh, four year four years ago. So it was, it was the board's recommendation. Um, we can do it either way. We can either do it per capita or uh, grand total amount. The per capita, I, I, I'll, I'll speak for the board four years ago, I think it was just felt that that maybe was an easier value to kind of comprehend understanding that, as you mentioned, total population, we're going we're gonna to go up by 1.2 million people. Vehicle miles traveled, it, total vehicle miles traveled is going to go up. But with these other factors coming in of, of cleaner vehicles, more efficient vehicles, maybe it would be easier to like understand on a per person or a per capita basis how much it's going down. And another reason I just thought of was that uh, I believe in the state uh, uh, plan on greenhouse gas uh, reductions is very close, comparable in concept to the statewide uh, goal. <laughs> so it can be done either way. Mr. Graves. So I think our preference is certainly the, the absolute measure, but given that it was set four years ago, it might be great to sort of re-examine or even touch base with the state to see if they've had additional discussion about this and if an absolute value may make sense for them as well. But I think it's probably the better measure for our purposes. Mayor Pertumale. I just was, how um, the potential future uh, EPA actions on the air quality, um, ozone, uh, all the, I can't remember the names of all the rules, Elise could probably help me out with that, but I guess what, what, what how do our goals align with the potential future um, federal standards that the region will be asked to meet? And I'll, I'll let Steve weigh in, but I'll just quickly, I mean, I don't know if it's about goals as much as it is about assumptions, right? So we have a, you know, we showed you, I think it was a 42% expect, expected uh, decrease per capita. A lot of that is about the CAFE standards coming into play, right? That, that the vehicles are simply going to become uh, more efficient, that the fleet will, will begin to turn over to all, more alternative fuel vehicles. That's really where a lot of that is coming from. Like we, our planning assumptions assume that there is fleet turnover over time with that sort of stuff. Uh, Council Member Quinn. Thank you. I just had a question as to how this target relates to local greenhouse gas emissions targets. Because I know a number of communities, Boulder, I believe, has a target, Denver has a target, Lakewood's going to be adopting a target in May. How does that fit into the regional reduction target? Well, one thing is obviously this is regional, um, and, and the other one is this is specifically related, related to service transportation facilities and, and the impact of transportation where oftentimes, you know, local GHG goals may bring other um, emissions sources into the conversation as well. So this is really geared towards transportation at the regional level. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Stolzman. Thank you. I would really like to support um, Mr. Graves' recommendation to bring back an absolute target. I think that makes a lot of sense to see that information and then be able to discuss it further. Council Member Plass. Well, I'm interested in the absolute number, too. I guess the other thing I'd like to know is, given what you have here as a per capita target and what our population would be, what, is, what does this actually mean, what we have now on the table in terms of our absolute emissions? That would be a really helpful thing for me to know kind of going forward in terms of, you know, what how, how the, the, the uh, measure that you've proposed versus the absolute and kind of what are we actually, what's the threshold that we're setting for ourselves? And maybe you have that information now. If not, I would like to have that when we come back. You know off the top of your head there. We are going to grow by 1.2 million people. And basically the current modeling that we have says that the total amount, so basically you can take this, what is it up there, 24? Five pounds, where are we? 26.8. 26.8. Uh, and we think it's going to go down by 45%, so that's, I don't know, 18. Multiply it times 4.3 million people. What we're seeing is that the grand total amount of greenhouse gas is going to be about the same. 
roughly, you know, about the same. But when you then divide it by a greater number of people, your per capita is going down 45%. Because remember, our total regional population, I believe, is going up 39%. Mm -hmm. So they kind of, what this is showing, it's kind of offsetting each other. Right now, looks like we'll have about the same total amount of, and this is transportation greenhouse gas related, so it's not other things, power plants and things like that, will be about the same, but because population is going up so much, the per capita is going down. So each individual is using less or emitting less, but there's 1.2 more, 1.2 million more individuals that are doing, you know, no, I, I get so that. I mean, I, I understand yeah. that. So I, I was just kind of curious going along with what Mr. Graves was saying about kind of, you know, what the, what the equivalency was. And I don't know what he was proposing in terms of whether the, given the information we have now, that was adequate or, you know, and I guess that would be keep GHGs from transportation even, right? That's what I'm hearing from you. Or you had another idea. <coughs> so colloquy, if I may. Don't really have a, another idea. I'd love to have staff take it back and, and really uh, discuss with us what they think the best path forward is. Council Member Thiel. Uh, actually, I thought that was a great explanation we got. The only problem is, is that then I look at that 60% and that 60% is way outside of projections. And then if we do talk about looking at our total impact uh, and not doing per capita, then we don't have a, a, a de facto decrease. We have parity. So then it makes me wonder, should we even be addressing this here? Should this even be a goal? Because we're, we're way out with the 60% out of uh, projections, and I would submit that's too far for us to drive to, to go from 46 to 60. So uh, I guess moving forward, I would like to see perhaps a more realistic, if we keep it per capita, or if we do go, as Mr. Graves suggested, then we accept parity, that, and, and that becomes our goal. So with the recommendation to scout staff that they look at an absolute rather than a per capita, and um, you know, one thing I think that it's important for us to always keep in the, con in, in the back of our mind is when we're looking at targets, are we looking at targets that are aspirational or easily attainable? So I mean that that that's part of that's part of the glad you're seeing the, the light finally, Jackie. Uh, Councilmember Kanich. Just just with a asterisk on moving it forward, that I really do think Jackie's question is important, which is aren't aren't the feds requiring us to try to lower it? Because you know the, the air doesn't care how many people are generating it, right? It just cares how much of it there is. And so, um, what is the federal movement pressure? Uh, clubs or carrots that are involved in this can clubs we, can we report back on that because I think that's really important thanks it's a good point okay moving on to item seven questions comments uh, Commissioner Partridge so for item seven actually uh, eight nine and ten as I understand there is federal standards set for seven eight nine and ten I'm just wondering do we have that in our in is that correct that there are federal standards for 7, 8, 9, and 10? No. Uh, no, not no. to my knowledge. Okay. I've, uh, I was told there was, so I will just check into that with my staff. Okay. Council Member Diet. <coughs> um, I, um, I, don't, I don't see any real big issue with, uh, with the foundational measure. However, uh, for those of us uh, in the South, uh, who don't have regular mass transit, it'd be difficult to participate in in getting to this target or benchmark. So um, I, I see that as a that as an issue or a constraint to this this target. Commissioner uh, Henry. You know I I find and I I feel your pain in Parker because a lot of places in Adams County are the same, um, and I find that you know this whole Metro Vision. I really have sometimes have a problem wrapping it around, wrap, wrapping my head around it because of the simple fact that I feel that it is very urban centric and we're forgetting our suburban areas like Parker, like Castle Rock, like Brighton, you know, like Commerce City, like North Glen. 
And I think this, you know, if this is really a metro vision that instead of talking about urban areas and rural, it, the conversation and missing out is suburban. And it, it is just, it, it's frustrating sometimes when, when I see these, these issues because mass transit also, you know, because of the way our neighborhoods are built, we, we're not going to have, be able to do that high density that they want. And even at that, there is a portion of this population that doesn't want to live in the high density. I live, live in Adams County as a compromise with my partner because I wanted to live in a condo downtown Denver. I know Denver people don't freak out, an Adams County person. With a, with a balcony that overlooked an alley next to a bar, but my partner wanted to live in Thermopolis, Wyoming, so Adams County is where we're at. <laughs> but I love Adams County. I did grow up in Adams County, but I just wanted to point out that not everybody wants to live in a high-density area, and not everybody wants to live in Thermopolis, Wyoming. So, thank you know, Adams yeah, thank yeah. God there's Adams County, but, you know, that we have to really start considering our suburban areas. I mean, we have over... 1.5 million people in this region that live in the suburban areas. Just a little rant. Council Member Kinch. Thanks. I think that's actually a really good point about the fact that not everyone lives in dense areas. And I think the thing that's interesting about this metric, though, is that those areas of the region that are dense will be in the best position to help deliver this. It's okay if there's you know 1,500 residents who are in a rural town center. Then, but there are you know 650,000 living in Denver, you know who can bike to work or whatever. And so it's not this. This goal is not about every community individually using every one of these modes, right? No one's going to commute. You know, well, maybe, 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 maybe tough people, but very few people are going to commute from rural Adams County to downtown Denver by bike. But I bet a lot of the way to go carpools that Dr. Cog does are two suburban areas because they don't have transit. So this captures not just transit, but carpooling. And because those urban centers that do have a lot of people, those people make up the statistic, right? So you know, if you have 650,000 people doing something differently, it, to it affects the regional number, even if 1,500 living in a rural town center don't do that thing. So, so this to me is about, again, just going back to something that Brad said in the beginning, these are about regional averages not about saying every single commuter has to, to do something. So I, I, and I just wanted to also note that this includes carpools, which I think are a very suburban form of, you know, kind of reducing single, single occupant vehicles. But um, I, we were going to say it seems a little low, since we've already been at um, 25 and 26 percent, 35 seems low, right, that we may be, especially if you think about it, 20 percent of fast tracks isn't built yet. So if we are, um, looking at the additional transit that's coming on board, right, and then during the time this plan is on, it doesn't seem like we're accounting for the trips that that's going to take. So it seems like it could go even higher if you count new transit that's already funded but not yet open, right? I mean, we have three lines that are funded. We have another line that we hope will be funded, <laughs> but it's certainly on its way. So thanks. Okay, I've got uh, Jones, Dyack, Henry, and then Malay, and then I would really like to move on. <laughs> Commissioner Jones. Um, I was going to make the points that Robin made about this being regional and not just related to transit, but I think it's a no-brainer to keep this goal in here, and I do think we should also look at whether or not it's ambitious enough. Councilmember Diet. And, and I mean, to me, I, I understand and accept uh, uh, Councilmember Kanich's uh, discussion. However, uh, being a regional player, I would like to know how I can participate. And, you know, uh, going back to... Um, Commissioner Henry's uh, comments. It, it 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 just seems like this is more of a uh, more of a, a, a Denver metric, um, and we we really can't participate. So I mean, I'm I'm challenged as to as to how the more rural players can can you know, kind of move the needle or help participate uh, relative to to the uh, more dense areas of of the region. Commissioner Henry. And my fear is, is what a few people have said around here is, is this plan is going to go into the TIP when we finally get TIP. And then the funding is going to go into those urban areas and the suburban areas once again are going to be left out. And that, that's where my fear is. Mayor Pro Timolay. 
And, and I would argue if I was in a, 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 and I am in a suburban area, but we are very fortunate that we're getting light rail, I would use this as a club over everyone who does have light rail or BRT because if we don't provide access from those suburban areas to the light rail station, we are not doing our job. We're, we've got to leverage that investment that's being made in BRT and in being made in light rail. So I, I would argue more money should be spent out of the future tips in the suburban areas to bring good, reliable bus transportation to the light rail stations or to get people to the BRTs. I mean, I really feel very strongly if we've spent all the money that we've spent on light rail and citizens in Parker can't get there, it's ridiculous. So I, I mean, I, I would argue that, and I consider myself a suburban community, we need to provide better RTD service out to those areas and that this board has an obligation to do that. So. Okay, unless somebody really has a burning question, I'd like to move on. And it sounds like obviously there are some, some conversations about different ways to look at this, but it is something that we want to move forward with. Item uh, eight, questions, comments. Yeah, but I want to understand how this plays in with what we're trying to do and some of the other foundational measures, how these all work together. Okay. Moving on then. The first question about item nine is whether or not people are comfortable with the explanation that Mr. Calvert gave about changing this to be travel time variance rather than what it says now. And at just one point of clear, yes. we aren't necessarily suggesting it as a substitute. We just, we were sort of putting it out there as based a, on the conversation that we heard last okay. month is let, 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 the, let, let the, com the committee sort through whether this feels like something that's more appropriate. Commissioner Jones. I wanted to know whether or not you looked at person hours of delay as a possible metric as well, because that would be another way of looking at it. And again, I would think that this would be something that would be useful to take to tack and look at the various ways um, to look at it. I do agree looking at just congested roadways doesn't feel like it, it quite encompasses our whole multimodal approach. So I agree that that's not the right one. I'm just not sure um, what would be better if it's, it's the alternative that staff proposed or if there's something more. So I would just encourage more investigation. Council Member Teal. Yeah, I'd like to go with the, I'd like us to look at the alternate as suggested by staff, just because it strikes me as, uh, as it sits, um, number nine is the world of science fiction. We're ignoring the data in order to put a limit there that we already think is, you know, going to be well below what we're actually going to need. Seeing no other hands with those comments, I would suggest that we move this one forward as well. Item 10, questions or comments? Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just wanted some information about how we selected this goal. Uh, earlier, Mr. Chairman, you posed a question about whether or not we are setting aspirational goals, right? I think this is one of the areas where aspirational would be wonderful, actually. So just wanted some feedback from staff. Well, you know, the part, of, part of this is, is art and science, right, if you, if you think about it. Um, you know, obviously, both, um, and I think the memo mentions this, both um, Federal Highway and, and CDOT have this sort of notion of towards zero deaths. Um, and so we kind of went to something that hopefully feels aspir aspirational, but also something that you could be achieved and kind of went with just sort of that nice round sounding number of 100. Um, again, this could be something that you could echo kind of where our partners are going and it could just be simply towards zero, but then you kind of lose the ability to actually have a numeric target. And Steve, I don't know if you want to add anything or? I mean, the way I've, uh, done an analogy to this is the Denver Broncos. I mean, their goal every single game is to win a game, is to win that game. Oh, maybe it's better to use a bad football team. Every, every <laughs> football team. Well, the Super Bowl. I won't talk about my CU Buffs. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so CU Buffs, the goal every game is to win that game. Now, at the beginning of the year, you know, is there, or the, really the goal is to not to lose any. And that's a sad, tragic thing with loss of lives and traffic fatalities. And every time you go out and make a trip, whether you're driving to the store, driving to work, riding your bike to work, you know, your goal is to arrive safely. So it's a dilemma of when you add up all those individual goals of every trip or of every game that's being played, yeah, your goal is zero losses. 
of whether it's a, a game or a, or a life. But do you find something in the middle that kind of is, I don't, I don't know if it's attainable, aspirational. And this is the route that um, CDOT has gone with their program, which uh, Governor Hickenlooper announced a couple weeks ago at the Capitol, is it's not this exact same number, but it's a comparable level of reduction that they've had. So that's that kind of dilemma we're in with a measure like this. One, Mr. Graves. One follow-up on the art and science, and I appreciate the balance you're trying to strike here. On, on the science side, if we looked at uh, comparable jurisdictions, like I know New York, New York has had a really aggressive program around fatalities reduction and a couple other spaces in the country. Have we looked at those and figured out uh, kind of what their science was and the numbers they've selected? We have not, but we can. When we, when the, if, if the committee chooses for this to come back, we can do that. Council Member Stolzman. I support keeping it in, and I think it's probably not um, – a low enough target based just because technology is changing so much and with like Google cars and Elon Musk putting in tube cities and things like that I think technology will help us outpace that goal okay I just mayor Cernanek just a PC dot I mean uh, Shailen spoke to the Metro mayors this morning and he talked about actually wanting to get to zero in Colorado so you know directionally it's it's going in the right piece whether it's the right number or not but we do need to have an element of safety because when you're talking about roads, um, you can talk all you want about congestion, but if you don't do it in a safe fashion, and this is at least a measure of safety. And uh, just for everybody's information, Shaylin is Shaylin Bott, the new director of CDOT, and he will be here at our next board meeting making a presentation as well. Seeing nobody else jumping up and down, I'm going to presume that we're going to move forward with that. Um, this is a terrible segue after number 10, but I, I just wanted to let you know that there is a complete highway shutdown at I-25 and 104th. There's a, that's what I was told was 104th. Uh, multiple, multiple vehicles, ejected passengers. So if you're going up I-25 after you leave here, you might want to think of something different. Sorry about that. Um, all right. So, Mr. Calvert, for items uh, five and six, asked for 30 to 40 minutes, and I've given him 12. Can, can I just ask one yes. point of clarification? If I tracked, everything's coming back in one shape, form, or fashion. I, Correct. Um, item number three, there was also you lots to talk about, talk about but the, still the, the recommendation of this group was to come back and, and to use um, Commissioner Jones's words, noodle on it a little bit more. Yes. So. It, and that's, that was what I had as well. Thank you okay. for recap. So moving on, we've got uh, item five, which is uh, resiliency. So I will do my best to make this quick. Um, you know, we can see kind of where we are on time because the, the last one I, I can certainly, the last agenda item, I, I can spend a, little, a few minutes talking to you, but it really is about a document that's in your packet that, that, that maybe you can sort of get through on your own and, and it makes some sense, but we can see where we are when I finish um, this presentation and obviously your um, conversation. So this really is about um, one of the points of emphasis in, in the draft is this idea of, of resiliency as, as a region. Um, and this is something that was talked about at the board workshop uh, back in February. And so really what I'm just simply asking you all to think about is help us hit the mark. Um, you haven't quite seen yet um, the element that's really going to focus on this. Though really the idea of re resiliency is integrated throughout the plan. But, you know, I want to understand kind of your perspective so that we can hit that, hit that mark um, or at least try to hit, hit the mark. So um, obviously um, this really builds on an amendment that, that was actually board introduced back in 2013 to really think more about wildfire issues uh, in Metrovision and, and that conversation really continued uh, to the board workshop back in 2013. Uh, this issue had, was, was an overwhelmingly popular issue to, to, to discuss during the stakeholder engagement efforts associated with Metrovision. Um, all sorts of actors from all different places around the region, this kept coming up for any number of reasons, whether it was property damage, loss of life, economic impacts, environmental impacts, it was just a, almost a universal uh, point of conversation. Um, as drafted, um, and if you, if you want to look in, in the, the draft, I think most of this is on page 51, um, you know, it's about limiting conflicts, um, integrating planning, um, as well as uh, coordinating amongst agencies and then thinking strategically uh, about open space. But as I mentioned, there's, there's a lot of integration of this issue throughout, throughout the document. 
Uh, so really at the board workshop, we, we just simply asked the question, you know, we've been hearing a lot of this from stakeholders, you know, the board, can you just kind of give us a sense, is this something that in your minds is a really important um, facet to be thought of in the plan? And the overwhelming answer from both uh, discussion groups was yes. You know, we want to be a resilient region, don't we? So, so if so, this should really be a lens that, that we think about. Um, it really is a, is a hot topic. You know, we can think about this as a framing issue as we have a conversation about the overarching vision for this region going forward. Um, that it should be about safeguarding um, amenities around this region for, for future generations. Um, that really a lot of the communities that are, that, are, that are having conversations on this topic right now, it really kind of boils down to simply bouncing back stronger than even prior to uh, the disruption. But the reality is that there are some chronic underlying conditions that oftentimes make that very difficult uh, to achieve. Uh, we heard that, it's, that there's nothing really new here. This is in our place in the world. Being resilient is just something that we have to do. Uh, but importantly, like many other things, let, let's make the term our own. It may be a hot term. It may be a, a nice term that people are, are buying into, but let's make it the term that really resonates in, in our region. So as I mentioned, the, the primary area um, is where this uh, discussion happens is in a section that you have not seen yet called, well, I guess you've seen it in the full packet, but we haven't presented um, uh, it to you, is a safe, safe and resilient built and natural environment. Um, I was hoping that we would maybe talk about that in May, so this conversation might help us hit the mark. After today's conversation and what we're bringing back, I, I'm worried that we won't have space for that conversation, but we, we can spend some time thinking about that. But as I mentioned, we do attempt to integrate it through, through many other areas. Um, I'll sort of skip down to the, to the last bullet. You know, one of the things that was suggested at the workshop is, you know, do we need to have a definition? And I, I wouldn't say that the draft has a formal definition, but it kind of informally refers to resiliency as the idea of the ability of the region to respond and recover from events. So that's, you know, not a formal de definition, but informally that's kind of how it's, how it's referenced in, in the draft. So the, the, the key piece where this is covered um, most directly in the plan is, is under outcome 11, and again, page, page 51. It's about reducing the risk and effects from, from natural hazards and has an objective associated with it to, to enhance uh, community resiliency by doing the bullets below are really kind of the strategies that, that are outlined. Let's, let's, let's think about expand, you know, our expansion into areas that, that are hazard uh, prone. Um, let's think about this through an integrated planning and response uh, perspective and then maybe open space is a tool that we can use to, to help manage sort of uh, urban advancements into, into hazard areas. As I mentioned, we do attempt to integrate this topic um, throughout the plan, and th these are just a few examples that were sort of top of mind. You know, is this, re is this region ready for the, the, the massive demographic changes that are, that are coming, uh, particularly the aging of the population? Um, do we have transportation systems, and are we, are we making investments in a transportation system that really does promote transportation choice? Underlying issue of managing the expansion um, of the urban expansion uh, of the region into places that again are, are known to have um, high uh, hazard probabilities. Uh, you know, are we creating uh, communities in, our, in a region that that gives people access to opportunity for advancement, services, um, education, personal fulfillment, all those things? Do, do, do our residents have the ability to do these things? Um, are, are we thinking about the um, quality of life amenities, including these sort of natural systems that really are uh, very big quality of life issues, but also economic drivers um, of this region, a very big attractor to why people make decisions to, to move to the Denver region? Um, in terms of sort of like, like the rest of the plan, it is very, you know, we are thinking about measuring progress going forward. Um, at the moment, there is, there, is, there is a single solitary measure that you could say is directly related to resiliency and it's related to this objective and it's, it's thinking about sort of that, that, that open space um, issue as a way to, to again, um, really kind of uh, uh, infiltrate areas that are known as high hazard areas. But there are other measures that, that I think you can see a connection, um, you know, share population with good um, access to jobs via transit. A uh, number of air quality days, uh, bad air quality violation days um, in the region. You know, how are our infrastructure ratings? Are, are we falling behind on maintaining the infrastructure um, in this region? Um, do we have, you know, high numbers of people that are living in areas with, with low access uh, to food? So with that, um, the discussion in all of about 10 minutes um, is really, honestly, it's about help us hit the mark um, the best that we can so that when we have a conversation, we've made as much progress um, as possible. Um, if there are any kind of initial things that just sort of spring to mind that we can, we can go ahead and take, take care of so that the next time you have a real conversation about this, we, we maybe move the ball a little bit. Um, 
you know, this group and the board has talked about this could be our lens. Well, I think it's important for you all to talk to each other, to, to talk to each other about what that means. Um, and then, you know, if there's any areas of the plan in particular that this should be an area of focus, and then if there are any measures or targets um, that, that come to mind on this issue. And with that, I'll conclude my presentation. Mayor Cernanen. I, I'm going to mention too, Brad, that I, I think um, kind of fit within what I'll call the Dr. Cog frame. Uh, you did mention demographics, but there, but there's two others. One is um, I don't know if there's an opportunity for sharing some construction standards with life expectancies as we start to talk about infrastructure and we talk about rebuilding. Um, you know, some thoughts around that. I know when CDOT was going through some of their reconstruction of roads, uh, they were looking towards, uh, you know, how do we make sure we plan for the 1,000 or the 500 year as opposed to the 100 year? And what does that mean for, for folks and, and such? And then also, um, I, I don't know where this fits because we have multiple types of jurisdictions that are here. But having some sort of discussion about what do we do with regard financial reserves on a jurisdiction level, uh, what do we do as far as a regional level, and um, I know there's some discussion uh, with the feds not addressing the issues and the state not addressing the issues, uh, what do we do with regard a metro transportation district or su some such concept uh, in resurfacing some of that. Councilman Mathieu. Um, just to address the big issue of should we MVIC apply a resiliency lens, uh, yeah, I think we should. I mean, I think uh, some of the conversations that came out earlier, um, you know, Tim and I had a nice little conversation as a part of the, uh, the stakeholders meeting up at uh, the retreat. You know, the reality is uh, we live in a region that is endemically, has endemic natural hazards. And just about every one of our communities in this room have fallen victim at one point in time. There is a Denver and not an Auraria, strictly because of a flood that hit in the 1860s. Um, and my own, my own town itself was cut off from the outside world for two weeks when a flood wiped out our two bridges to I-25 in, in 1961. So I, I think we really should. I, I think it's, uh, this is the region we live in. We should address this. Commissioner Jones. I wanted to take the uh, opportunity to say I totally agree with George. Um, <laughs> Kumbaya. No, um, no I, I think that's right. And I want to go back to um, a moment that we had as the, I guess it was the Economic Vitality Subcommittee meeting with some of the economic development gurus in our region. And I think it was, um, I forget which one of it was. It was Tom Clark. But talking about how Dr. Cog could play a really important role uh, as a planning entity in forecasting and in helping us all prepare for the risks facing the region, you know, be it any number of things, water or, um, you know, affordable housing issues that we already discussed, that given um, the expertise and the tools available at the staff level for forecasting and scenario planning that really that was an important role that Dr. Cobb was playing in the region and, and I think we should take that to heart and resiliency is about um, I, I think it's important to have both of the components that you mentioned um, Brad about both being able to bounce back when there's disruptions such as natural hazards that we do seem to be prone to but also dealing with chronic weaknesses that impede our ability to be resilient and I think it's it's both of those things so um, I do think it's appropriate lens for Dr. Cog to have in this iteration. I'm going to give uh, Commissioner Rozier the last word. I don't agree with any of you. <laughs> no, how's that? Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Brad, could you go back one sure. slide? I, I'm I'm concerned with with objective 11.1 and uh, I'm glad you use small o small s on open space because when you look at our open space charter you look at Jefferson County open space we will not it goes against our charter we will not buy open space to get in the way of or prohibit development we absolutely oppose that 
I'm a very strong supporter of that position. We will not use tax dollars to hinder development. And when I read this, amount of high-risk areas protected as open space or park, I have a problem with that because you can have that, that urban interface. You can have it, if it's done well, it can be very safe. It can be very productive to a community. When you have a park that is not kept up, when you have open space that is not managed and it's just left there to overgrow, that's more of a risk than if it's developed and with housing and with commercial or any other operations there. And we've seen that time and time again in Colorado. So I, I don't like objective 11.1 .1 at all. I think it's very deceiving that open space and park is more safe. It's not. That's why there was legislation six years ago having to do with Denver Mountain Parks in Jefferson County. Because they weren't being maintained and it was a fire hazard. And guess what? It was a park. So I don't want to put in here this the, the idea that open space and park is, is great. Um, they are great, but they don't give us any more resiliency. In fact, they can add to the dangers. Thank you. I know that there are two people with their hands up, but we are literally two minutes from our hard stop. So uh, we can continue the conversation. <laughs> we, we can we can continue the conversation, but at, um, at another time. But I'm going to have to cut cut it off uh, on that note, um, on that non-controversial note. Um, <laughs> so, um, in, so agenda item number six is uh, now going to be just informational for you to read and digest and uh, ask questions of staff, and we'll probably talk about it further at a future meeting. Uh, I will mention one other thing under other matters. If you have not done so already, I encourage you to fill out one of these statement of interests to serve on the MVIC committee. Um, need to have them from for, for Connie. So please fill one out, get it to Connie. I was told that I don't have a choice, so I, I, so, but everybody else has to. Um, any other items for the good of the cause? Mr. Graves. Something very brief, Mr. Chairman. I believe it's actually Shailen Bat at the Metro Mayor's Caucus. He was very clear this morning that it was Shailen Bat and not Bot. Okay. okay. All righty. Tomato, tomato. I don't get faxes directly. So our next meeting is May 6th. Next meeting is May 6th uh, at 4 o'clock, and we are adjourned. Oh, hey, please, uh, please police your area, including your name tags, if you would, please, and take them out. Thank you.